thanks for hanging in there with us um, while we got this got this all set up. Um, if, you, if I'm a new face to you, my name is Lynn Rohr. I'm actually the director for the Open Source Community Work here at Sun, and uh, it's our great pleasure tonight to have uh, Brendan Gregg with us. He's a, all right. So Brendan's a member of the Fishworks team. It's the engineering team who brought us the Sun Story 7000. In addition to that, uh, Brendan has worked on the D-Trace Toolkit. Um, and he's an author of the Solaris Performance and Tools book, if you've never seen this. We have three tonight that he would be happy to sign and autograph. And then finally, his most recent fame probably comes from his abusive behavior to j -Bob. So he's got a wonderful uh, video out on YouTube if you ever want to go take a look at it. And, uh, some very interesting performance results of shouting at j -Bus. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Lynn. And uh, welcome to Prozog. This, this is the first time I've been here. I'm Brendan Gregg. And uh, tonight I've been asked to give a performance talk. I'm actually here in Colorado teaching a performance class um, that I wrote. So performance is very much on my mind right now. And I've also been, uh, of course, I'm always working on performance analysis. So this talk, uh, someone suggested the title Little Shop of Performance Horrors because we're near Halloween in the US. So uh, sounds good to me. I usually give talks on how to perform performance analysis, uh, cool performance analysis technologies, and awesome benchmark results. I've given lots and lots of talks. I've reached the point where I like to give different talks, um, partly for my own amusement as much as yours. And with the title, Little Shop of Performance Horrors, I thought it'd be great to give a talk entirely about things going wrong. So nothing in this talk is good. This is all about things going wrong, what mistakes we've made. I actually think it's a very useful way that, that we learn and how we develop experience with various topics is learning from our mistakes. It's a complicated thing to talk about. It's a tricky thing to talk about. I can't, on the screen, go through uh, the worst performance mistakes uh, various customers of Sun have made because uh, the customers wouldn't like that very much. So I have to be careful about um, what I do talk about, um, things that are public are easy, like the, the, uh, the bugs in open source and the bug database. So I can understand why people don't do this that much, talk about mistakes, but I want to have a crack at it because it's, uh, it's useful. Um, each of them provides lessons that we can learn from. This is not just one or two hours of misery, this is one or two hours of uh, small discrete lessons. Don't make these mistakes because I've made them. So what I want to talk about is the worst performance issues I've ever seen. And there's just a couple that really, really spring to mind that take the cake. Um, they're public. Fortunately, they're far worse than anything any customer has done. Common misconfigurations. Uh, there are still many out there, and uh, it's use useful to iterate over them. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Poor Assumptions. Uh, I'd like to spend some more time filling this out, but I... Uh, with performance analysis, there are a lot of assumptions people make that aren't quite right, uh, and you'll get to see that. Unbelievably bad performance analysis. I've got one example there that is actually pretty common. Uh, death by complexity, bad benchmarking, misleading analysis tools, of which there are many, some insane performance tuning, of which I was doing some this week, and the curse of the unexpected. So I thought about what... What topics encapsulate all the bad areas of performance? I think this is the, uh, this is the set. So, the worst performance issues I've ever seen. <laughs> Anyone remember SMC, the Slides Management Console? In Slides 9, this thing took a while to boot. If you had just uh, freshly installed a server and then fired up SMC, it could take half an hour to boot, 30 minutes. What was it doing that whole time? So as it turns out, it was doing 12 million mostly one-byte sequential reads of a 72-kilobyte file. So I've seen in textbooks people try and teach tools like Trust and Dtrace by saying, for example, a classic performance issue would be an application that does one-byte reads. Of course, no one would actually do that. <laughs> it's like, well, Actually, we have done that. SNC does. This doesn't have to be a, a, a theoretical example. This is a real example. 12 million mostly one-byte sequential reads 
During startup, it fired 7.7 thousand processors. Mostly they're SAID and, and ORC and Shell, uh, which you could replace with, say, Perl. Over 9,000 disk events, 2,000 of them writes to that 72 kilobyte registry.sur file. So, uh, a textbook example of something going wrong. The analysis was performed using DTrace. Who in the room has used DTrace? Hooray, lots of people. So if you haven't played with DTrace, my instinct is to give you the, uh, like the, the previous performance talks I've, I've given, awesome performance tools, but I'm gonna try and stick to things that are bad. But DTrace is very cool, and you can uh, examine things very easily. The SMC issues were identified with syscall frequency counts and syscall arguments. DTrace lets you look at the whole stack. I can look inside the kernel, I can look inside Java code, which is what the uh, SMC is written in. So I can, I can the, the 30 minutes of latency is really ripe for the taking. It's gotta be somewhere and DTrace can find it. So I don't really need to stick to traditional system calls. I could be more fancy and go through Java and go through anything, but they just worked. Why they probably haven't been found before would be due in part to the 7.7 thousand processes executed. So to do syscall analysis previously, one of the best tools is Trust for it. And of course I'm a DTrace guy, but Trust does have some benefits. It's simple to run. It gives you nice translations of, of arguments. But Trust only runs on one process at a time. So one of the advantages about DTrace is it can DTrace any process on the system and uh, especially if you, if you have 7.7 thousand of them, it can gather information as they're executing and ending. So that's probably why this is so easy to pick with DTrace. Um, very much low hanging fruit. A lesson from this, these aren't just tales of woe so that we all feel depressed. Examine high level events wherever possible. Um, one of the big problems in performance analysis is people assume that they know what's going on. They don't look at the easy stuff. Uh, what, if I'm looking at a server and it's processing NFS traffic, what files are being accessed? It's pretty simple. What clients are accessing my NFS server? A lot of people try and dive down the deep end and look for tunables, uh, look for, let's tune the number of mount D threads, let's tune the, the mount options. Start with the big stuff. What are the highest level events? And, and syscalls are really a high level event. The interface between user land and the kernel, how the user land asks the kernel to perform tasks. Um, it's a very useful high level event to have a look at. So even though of course I can do DTrace at, at, at any layer of the stack, I do spend a lot of time looking at system calls because they're easy and they are the high level events. Another of the worst performance issues I've ever seen. Uh, has anyone used the NXG device driver? So, so one person admits to it. I can talk about this because it is public, uh, this information. In fact, if you're, if you're interested in uh, my SMC DTrace analysis, I did that before I joined Sun recently and I wrote a, this is when DTrace was new and no one knew what it was. I actually wrote a website on it and showed how I DTraced SMC. So, um, and that was a, a pathologically bad application at the time. I, I didn't mention, but I should. There is a happy ending. Performance did get a lot better when they shipped Solaris 10 properly. So um, don't think that SMC is terribly bad now. Have a second look at it. Um, and DTrace certainly helped. NXGE is Sun's uh, 10 gigabit network device driver. Uh, I was involved in a lot of testing during product development and NXGE really had some of the worst performance problems I've ever seen, which we fixed. So don't feel bad about using NXG. This is, we identified these in product development before the products were shipped to customers. So like I said, it's tricky to talk about performance issues, but disclaimer, you shouldn't be running into these issues because we found and fixed them. One of the earliest issues I found was that the case stats were wrong. So case stats are the kernel statistics. Uh, that's how it's a fantastic uh, framework inside the kernel designed by Jeff Bonwick and uh, you can gather statistics on all sorts of different kernel modules. That's how tools like IOSTAT and VMSTAT work these days uh, and there's all sorts of interfaces into KSTAT, Perl, 
C, lib, lib case stat, and so on. Case stats are how you find out network interface traffic. So netstat minus i, which I'm not a fan of, it doesn't give you much info, that uses case stats. Uh, if you're using any sort of uh, other network monitoring tools, probably pulling the information out using case stats. I was doing performance tuning for NextGE uh, for the Sun Storage product line, and we have analytics, which is a, it's often touted as a D-trace based tool, uh, but the truth is it's both D-trace and case stat. We don't use D-trace if you can gather the information from case stat. If it's already there, we take it and plot it. I spent a long time tuning it and I couldn't get the performance to improve in a consistent manner. It took me a while to figure out, but not too long, that the case stats were wrong. The case stats that were reporting the received bytes and the out bytes were incorrect. So that's a bit of a challenge. You're performance tuning a server. You're applying load. You're changing tunable parameters. And you're monitoring the traffic to see if you can improve it. And what you're looking at is just wrong. It's garbage. So um, there's a CR for that. It turns out that's not the, that wasn't the first time that those case stats were wrong. So those case stats have been wrong before in NXG. They've been wrong for other drivers as well. The lesson here, don't trust statistics you haven't double checked. Very important. How did I figure this out? Anyone have an idea? How would you test, say, in this example, case stats for network device in and out bytes? Were you like counting packets or something? Uh, how would I count packets? I, I could count packets and then, uh, and then, and then, if I've got a known packet size, I could do some math. That would work. I could count packets. I know the packet size is 32 kilobytes or whatever, and the bytes don't equal the packet count. Yep, that's one way to do it. Uh, another way, and something that the performance class I've been teaching this week, I've dwelled on a lot, becoming ex excellent at performance and doing performance analysis, half the problem is using observability tools. The other half of the problem is performing experiments, experimentation. And you need to get good at experimentation. Here, I wrote a tool to move 10 megabytes over the network. Actually, I just... I think I mounted an NFS share and just copied 10 megabytes and then looked at what the case stats told me. And it didn't tell me 10 megabytes, it told me 5 megabytes. So that was wrong. <coughs> but experimentation is an a extremely valuable skill to have. Um, uh, and, and to dwell on that just for a second longer, in the Perf class this week, we've been developing D-Trace scripts and performance analysis scripts. But there's really two directories we've been putting them into. One of them is simple experimental programs that generate simple workloads, and the other one are the scripts to monitor them. More for, from, from NXG. Okay, so the case stats are wrong. That's, you know, that's, not, not such a, that's not the worst performance problem ever. There was a leak in NXGE. The kernel grew to 122 gigabytes in two hours flat. This is on a system with 128 gigs of DRAM. Once it had grown to 122 gigabytes, there was no room left for the ZFS arc. So I noticed this because I was performing a disk I.O. test that was supposed to be cached in DRAM. Performance was fantastic. Over a period of two hours, performance started to degrade and then it flatlined. It was like performance of, of 7200 RPM disks. It was supposed to be hitting from cache. It was a memory leak, um, NXG with LSO uh, enabled. The original CR, when I filed it, 17 megabyte per second kernel memory leak. Uh, I've talked to a few kernel engineers. I think that's the fastest kernel memory leak of all time. Uh, I mean, that's 17 megabytes every single second. We're just leaking memory. So uh, pretty impressive stuff. The lesson to learn from this uh, I'm sure we've all seen memory leaks in user land. Um, Firefox has been notorious. Um, they're getting better. But memory leaks can happen in the kernel too. They're kind of difficult to, uh, to troubleshoot. At user land, you can identify memory leaks pretty easily. If you ran top or PR stat, you would see a process had a larger resident set size. But for the kernel, you're going to need to poke around MDB, um, look at the, the KMA caches, look at the mem stat. Uh, much more difficult. 
But this is actually the worst performance problem I've ever seen. This is also an XGE. Large send offload destroyed performance with a particular putback. When I filed it, uh, actually I, I went and uh, adjusted a bug and I changed its priority from three to one and that was my justification. It was a 1000x performance regression. I have never seen performance regress more than 1000x. So this record could be beat if, if people try really hard. Uh, it was actually quite confusing because I was analyzing it using analytics and analytics, uh, which is the dtrace slash kstat feature from the Sun Storage products, it gives you plots of network traffic and it will tell you the units, whether you're looking at megabytes a second or kilobytes a second or gigabytes a second. And I was performing a known test and I'm looking at it thinking, it seems to be just a little bit slow. Maybe I'm out by 5%. Then it took me a while to realize, wait a minute, that says K. It should say M for megabytes. It's like, ah, oh, there's a problem in analytics because we're still developing analytics. So I'm going through the analytics source code. Somehow I'm printing out the wrong units. You know, I'm doing that calculation wrong. After a couple of hours, I realized I'm not printing out the wrong units. This is actually kilobytes. It's like, could we actually have a 1000x regression? We actually had a 1000x regression. Uh, that was enabling soft... LSO is actually the uh, large send offload. That's one of the features to improve performance, but destroyed performance. The lesson from this, all configurable options must be tested and retested during software development for regressions, you know, such as LSO. Uh, network cards are complicated because there are lots of different network cards available. 10 gig cards, to test them properly, you need 10, gig cap 10 gigabit capable networks. So there's the resource difficulty. And there's also lots of different configurable parameters. You might switch on jumbo frames, LSO, um, various tunables, other, other tunables in EDC system or in kernel DRV. And uh, any combination of them can uh, really hurt performance. So. Don't worry, you won't run into this as a customer if you're using NXG because we've identified and fixed them. Uh, but we learned our lesson in that we have to test all configuration options thoroughly uh, before each release. I think, I believe Brian Wong has a, uh, a quote along the lines of, if it hasn't been tested, then performance is poor. Uh, the things you're not looking at can regress badly. You need to t test them all. Uh, anyone have any other worst performance issues they've ever seen they'd like to uh, confess to, now that I've confessed to, the, to, to mine? I've had plenty of customers who set their application working directory as temp. Ah, the application working directory to temp. So that works with all those files and stores all the data. And they're assuming temp's in DRAM, therefore it's going to be super fast. Ah, memory consumption. Oh, this, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that would hurt. So the... So the, the <laughs> yeah, once you start paging and swapping, performance kills. So customers who are tuning their apps to put their working files in slash temp, slash temp will just gobble up as much DRAM as, as it can. And once that happens, you'll go into paging to start with. And once paging realizes it's not working so well, you go into thread swapping. Um, so it's a quick way to go from applications that are using DRAM to disk I.O. And of course, you, that's where you get 10, 100x regressions. Uh, another one? Uh, along those lines, I've seen where um, the because of our cache, like, isn't, doesn't pay attention to its, uh, its uh, limits to the list in the system, and will just like suck out the entire RAM of the system. Maybe I should have added this one, um, because it is public knowledge. Um, the ZFS Arc cache, uh, the, the adaptive replacement cache in ZFS, it's pretty complicated and it's had a few performance uh, issues. Um, I've worked on some of them. Mark maybe is the, the, the main author of the Arc. Uh, and it's a, it's a complicated thing. Um, just to start with, when you're dealing with the, uh, the system in the kernel that, that manages DRAM for processes, you have lots of threads accessing it frequently. You have lots of locks. Uh, if anything goes wrong, it goes wrong in a hurry and will freeze and lock the system. So it's a difficult context to work in. There have been problems with the ZFS arc, uh, and one of, the, uh, one of the problems was 
when it, re when, it, when it tracked how much memory it consumed, it didn't quite get the numbers right. And so it thought that it didn't quite consume as much as it did. The lesson there is, let's say you're designing a cache. How much memory does the cache consume? Well, how much data is consumed by the cache? How, how much data is referenced? That's not the full story. Caches also have the metadata that points to the data. You've got to track that as well. And any other list structs and so on and so on. That stuff was mostly done correctly, but you know, there, was, there was a few structures that were missed. And because of that, the cache could grow so big, the kernel got unhappy. And when the kernel gets unhappy, you can tell various kernel modules to do um, memory reaping now. You need to reap your memory now. When that happened with the ZFS arc, it could toss out uh, up to 50% of its, of its hot cache just to clean up rapidly because the kernel to told it to. So that was actually a particularly bad performance problem because you spend so much time waiting for your cache to warm up, and because of a little logic bug, it throws out half of itself, like <laughs> amputating all that nicely hot data. So uh, yeah, that was a bit of a problem. The other problem is the, the arc was getting quite aggressive and kicking out process pages, which people were running into as well. Um, and that's why uh, the algorithm has been improved and improved and improved. Um, on the evil CFS tunables guide, they have um, capping the arc size so that it doesn't compete with your applications. But certainly, in terms of bad performance, any time you go from DRAM to disk, it's going to be really bad. And, so, um, and that's something that the, that the arc is at the heart of. But the good news is the arc is getting uh, a lot better. Any other uh, worst performance things to confess to? There, there were a couple of good ones, a couple of classics. Common misconfigurations. Uh, I work in the storage, uh, the, work mostly with the Sun storage equipment, and so we see this a lot. ZFS RAID Z2, a double parity RAID, and it's configured on half a JBOD of disks. So half a JBOD of disks, that may be 12 disks. If you configure a double parity RAID stripe across 12 disks, that might be one stripe. Now, if that's all you've got in your system, one stripe, and you're accessing it, performance can really suck. The latency is that of the slowest disk in the stripe. More importantly, with so few stripes, and in this example, one, if you throw a multi-threaded workload at that system, it will queue because there's only virtually one disk who's able to respond to each thread. So each thread beyond one, you just increase your I.O. queue. Uh, I've, been, I've, I've seen this issue where people have told me my NFS response time, NFS latency, uh, is 50 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds. That's huge. Uh, even with slow 7200 RPM disks, you shouldn't really be going much beyond 10 milliseconds for a random I.O. But people are observing 50 milliseconds and higher. And this is, this is one of the main culprits. You've got only 12 disks. You set up double parity RAID. It treats it as one stripe, therefore one disk. And you put a multi-threaded workload on that and the other threads queue. So if you actually have 10 disks and you put 10 threads on it, and those disks are set up as a, a stripe or, or mirroring, then you have concurrency. So multiple spindles can get involved responding to different I.O. in parallel. But if you only have one stripe, that can't happen. Everyone needs to access that one stripe and everyone queues. So that's the biggest problem so far. Um, and it's just a misconfiguration. If you only had 12 disks, set it up as a uh, single parity RAID, so the stripe width is only four or five, or set up as mirroring, which has very good performance as well. Max throughput configurations without jumbo frames. Uh, it's still surprising how reluctant people are to turn on jumbo frames. Jumbo frames causes issues. We haven't enabled on all, all the switches. Like, when will we actually enable jumbo frames by default on all the switches? It, it does help performance a fair bit, uh, depends on the network driver and the network card for NXGE going from 1500 MTU to jumbo frames, it's about a 30% performance win. 
That's actually not too much, uh, and that's because of NXGE's LSO, large send offload. With large send offload, the TCP IP stack is already aggregating multiple packets and then sending them down to the card, and the card will deconstruct them into the smaller packets. So because of large send offload, 1500 MTU traffic works so damn fast. And going to jumbo frames is only a 30% win. With other cards and other drivers, um, going to jumbo frames might be 5x better or something like that. The other common misconfiguration is not using 10 gigabit Ethernet ports. So 10 gigabit Ethernet's been around for a while now. The price of switches and infrastructure is going down. But customers are still deploying a, a high throughput environments and are using one gigabit networks or trunking one gigabit networks. Uh, use 10 gigabit. I do, I am sympathetic because um, there has been lots of problems of 10 gigabit. In fact, I mentioned a bunch of NXG that were fixed. Uh, and also 10 gigabit re just requires a lot of horsepower to drive on both the server and the client. But it works. 10 gigabit does work. Um, so if you've got a high performance config, and, and I hear 40 gigabit is on its way, 100 gigabit's been defined as well, so... Um, of course, or you can use InfiniBand uh, or other technologies. Another common misconfiguration is uh, synchronous write workloads without ZFS log devices. This is an, another common one we see. So, with uh, file system workloads, you're usually doing synchronous reads, you know, application wants something, asynchronous writes, which is the default, or you're doing synchronous writes. You're doing synchronous writes because you've opened a file with the odsync flag, or your application calls fsync, or your, if it was over NFS, your, your client NFS driver thought it was a, a good idea to sync out the dirty blocks. Linux happens to do that a fair bit, which we're trying to uh, reduce. Uh, and there are other ways you can end up having a synchronous write workload. If you're doing a lot of uh, file and directory operations, for example, you untar a file with, with millions of small files. Uh, those file and directory operations can become synchronous as well. The problem with synchronous workloads is, synchronous write workloads is the server can't respond to the client until that write has been flushed to stable storage, so it's slow. So you should really only use synchronous write when you actually want that, when the, the, the program or application requirements demand. If you go from an asynchronous write workload to a synchronous write workload, the performance difference is huge. So asynchronous, the, the target, ZFS, for example, can just buffer those writes and flush them out in transaction groups later. With synchronous, it has to wait until the disk is flushed completely. We did solve that. So if you do have a synchronous write workload, you can, you can create uh, ZFS slog devices, uh, separate log, separate intent log. And that is where you have a, a separate device. It could be a hard disk device or it could be a write optimized flash. And when you do those particular synchronous writes, it can write to that separate device in a sequential and optimal manner so that it's on stable storage as quickly as possible and then allow the client to continue. And then later destage it to disk from DRAM. Is Neil Perrin here today? I thought he might be turning up. He's the author of the, uh, of, of the ZFS slog, and I, I think he's based here, so he is. So uh, that's, just, that's just one that we, we happen to see. And one of the problems with uh, synchronous write workloads is customers don't understand what is synchronous and what isn't. And it, it, I guess it's not that easy to identify what is and what isn't. If you're in a client and you're looking at an application how do you identify whether your application is doing synchronous or asynchronous writes? There's no easier answer to this. Depends on the client. Um, you could look at open flags, trust or strace. Uh, LSOF or P files might look at open flags on a running process to see if that open flag has sync or OD sync. Uh, you could see whether the application was calling F sync. Uh, maybe dtrace can pull that out. You can look over the wire to see if the client NFS driver was calling commit, which will also make it synchronous. 
So it's not an easy thing to identify, but uh, if you have it, you really want to use a SOG device to improve performance. It's classic and it's worth mentioning, uh, not running the latest software bits. We fix lots of things in performance all the time. We add features, things regress slightly, we fix them. So when I was a customer, because I was a system administrator and, and, and consultant and instructor, you kind of got tired with the sun telling you all the time, install the latest software bits. Install the latest software bits. Like any performance issue you had, they seemed to, to not be so willing to look into it. It's just, just install the latest patch set and then get back to us. Having worked on the inside now, I can see why that mentality happens. Because you really want to be running the latest. There are so many fixes we put in and improvements, uh, release after release, that it makes sense. 4 by 1 gigabit Ethernet trunks and using less than 4 clients. So if you use a protocol like LACP to trunk across multiple 1 gigabit interfaces, if you use one client, how many of those interfaces can you talk to at a time? One or four? Someone says one. What about four? Who thinks we can talk to four at the same time with one client? Come on, I trunked across four one gigabit inter interfaces. No, one, no one's going to no be gullible about this. All right. So uh, just the way LACP works, it will map, it will hash map one client to one port. But we frequently see people try this out. They set up a four by one gig trunk and they want to know why it doesn't do four gigabits per second. And they're only testing using one client. Setting up trunks, it really only works well if you have lots of clients so that they hash properly across all those ports. And if that's a problem, and it can be a real problem, uh, ooh, I should have added, I'll add this to the slide deck afterwards. Uh, I'll have to pick the section. Some of the uh, other horrific problems we've had with LACP. So I had a uh, test farm that I do all the performance testing on the Sun storage systems. It is 20 blades. And I was testing out LACP performance, 4 by one gig ports. And I could only make two of the four ports busy at a time. I was like, how unlucky am I? I've, I've, got, four, I've got 20 clients, but I can only make two of four ports busy. Like, are 20 clients just mapping to two ports? How does that work? So uh, the hash algorithm I was using was IP address. And when I installed the clients, I gave the network interface a even numbered IP address and the service processor an odd numbered IP address. Iterate that over 20. And if you're just using the main interfaces, they're all even numbers. And they only map over to half of the available ports. So I thought, ah, oh, well, that's stupid. I'll change the LACP protocol, uh, the LACP uh, option, and make it hash off the MAC address. The exact same thing. So the way the, the blades are shipped, um, when they allocate the MAC address for the ports, well, you get even number MAC addresses for one and odd numbers for the other. So it's like, ah, oh, that's, that's, that's also really unlucky. Uh, there was a third option, and that was to map off the TCP client port number. So when you're doing TCP traffic, um, the client allocates some pseudo-random number in the 50,000s or whatever. That's just part of the TCP protocol. It's like, okay, finally I've found something that's random enough I'll map over all 40 ports. Uh, then I only mapped over one of them. Only one port was active. And the problem is, with the client farm, I would boot all the systems at the same time and when they begin to allocate TCP ports, they would all allocate them in lockstep. <laughs> because they, you allocate, it's not actually pseudo-random, you allocate them um, serially and then lap. So every single option I tried, I could not map across all ports, unless I went and changed the IP address on all the systems. Uh, this is when uh, Brian Cantrell was working with me and he got frustrated. He went to the kernel source and added a new LACP option, which is random allocation. Like, doesn't matter what it is, I'm just going to randomly pick one of the four ports and, and give it to you, uh, which worked much better than anything else we'd tried. But uh, that was a bit, of a bit of a disaster. So lack P. Just use 10 gig if you can. Encyclopedia of Port Assumptions. 
More CPUs equals more performance. Uh, not if the threads don't scale. So it's a, it's a classic problem. And these days we've got, we've got so many CPUs we can throw at workloads. So CPUs often have four or six or eight cores now. And you may have virtual threads as well. But if the lock architecture hasn't been designed well enough, you don't scale. Uh, how things are usually solved, but there's, there's a bunch of ways you can solve it. One way is don't lock. Don't have locks. Try to work out some logical way to avoid using locks for those code paths or to minimize the use of locks. Why I'm bringing up locks is, is because that's one of the main reasons you don't scale. Um, you have uh, the code needs to access a lock. When you have, say, 64 CPUs want to access the same lock, only one CPU can make forward progress that has the lock if you only have one lock. And so that's why we need strategies to get around it. Um, another strategy is hash locks. Uh, the ZFS L2 arc does this because you have multiple threads accessing buffers. And so a hash of the buffer address is taken um, and that will point you to one of 256 different locks that you then use to access that buffer. And it's simply a way to scale from uh, one lock to many locks so that multiple CPUs can make forward progress. In fact, that hash, uh, even though it seemed like a really good idea, and it was done really well, it, it even had a padding for the, for, the, for the locks in the hash table. One of the gotchas with, with hash table locks is if you just declare an array of locks so that you can scale over 64 CPUs, what you may have is uh, a bunch of locks fit into a cache line on the processors. And so if a CPU is accessing that cache line and dirtying it because it's accessing the lock, it has to do cache coherency traffic with everyone else. And that kind of sucks. So if the ZFS l I believe there's a 64-byte pad after each lock just to reduce the cache line hit rate. So very clever implementation. Uh, but recently, we were scaling up to 256 CPUs and, and in even bumping up the hash lock count to 512 more work needs to be done. Uh, so it's always, it's heavyweight engineering to solve that problem, to scale across multiple CPUs. Sun's been very good at it because we've, uh, uh, we've tried to have the best scalable kernel available, but it is hard engineering work. Any given application that a customer runs on, say, 256 CPUs, like you, you are hugely lucky if you can use them all. It is a difficult task. Faster CPUs equals more performance. Not if your workload is memory I.O. bound. And I see that a lot with storage devices because with a storage server, its job is to move data from, from one port to another, from your SAS ports to the network ports or vice versa. Uh, but it's also the case for many other workloads. Memory bound is where your, rather than being Rather than your workload being throttled by the available CPU cycles to do work, your workload is throttled by waiting on memory access. How do you identify that? Anyone tell me? If you've been reading my blog carefully, you can. How do you identify if your workload, instead of being CPU bound, is memory bound? I just said it's pretty frequent. You want to, you want to get good at this. Anyone? Anyone? What's that you use? Ah, but with VMstat, so, so I'll describe this a bit better. I don't mean memory bound, meaning um, consuming a volume of memory. I actually mean the I.O. access. So yeah, VMstat can, can give you an idea if you're, if you're consuming too much memory uh, because eventually you'll hit the old-fashioned page out scanner and you'll see scan rate. Even though that's not the primary management for memory often, at least it still kicks in eventually and then you know you're in hell. Or, or you swap out entire threads. Um, I'm talking about actual I.O. Like you're doing too many gigabytes a second to main memory. That's actually your bottleneck. How do you identify that case? It's common. If there's one thing you can learn tonight, you can learn this. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's, that's, the only guess that I have. that's a good. That's a solution. That's a good idea. You can do uh, processor sets. Um, 
Uh, there's memory groups, locality groups that you can tune. Um, there's a whole bunch of things you can do there to improve the situation. What about identifying that that's the problem in the first place? Ah, that's a very good and incorrect observation. If you were, me- if you were memory bound, you would not be able to max out the CPUs. So how are you observing maxing out the CPUs? What tool? How, how, do you, how do you know if you've maxed out the CPUs? What tool would you run? Yeah, PSSAT, MPSAT, VMSAT, doesn't matter. That actually doesn't work. This is why I'm bringing this, this is why I'm dwelling on this because it's something that, that I'd, I'd like everyone to learn. So if you're looking at um, VMSAT and PRSAT and you're actually memory I.O. bound, it will say the CPUs are 100%. Even though you're waiting on memory I.O. And the reason for that is when you begin a, a CPU instruction such as a load or a store, you, the CPU will actually you know, set up various internal registers it needs to, and then it will access memory I.O., and it will stall until that memory I.O. completes. Whilst it's doing that, th- those are stall cycles. Once it completes, that instruction has completed. But it's all part of an instruction. And as far as the kernel's concerned, that time was spent in an instruction in a legitimate code path. It doesn't, it doesn't know that most of that instruction was stalled on memory. So when your memory I.O. bound, your CPUs go to 100%. And customers go and buy faster CPUs, and it doesn't help. You just stall faster. <laughs> it, can D-Trace tweet that out? With difficulty, it might be able to. Uh, yeah, this one's tough. Listen to disk. Well, it, it may not be. It may not be going to the disk it, it, with memory I/O throughput. It's just the DRAM banks that you're clogging up. Any other suggestions? Yeah. You, you could, right? You could get a faster memory bus. That'd be cool. That, that would help, right? You might get a bigger L1, L2 cache with faster CPUs and reduce the need to access the memory bus. That would help as well. So um, the main way that I use to identify this situation is to measure the cycles per instruction. So I've just described the problem, and that is when you're executing an instruction, if it stalls on memory because memory's clogged, you spend all these cycles waiting on it. So if you're able to, to pluck out this value called cycles per instruction, it goes like this. If it's one or less, you're not memory bound. You're processing CPU instructions pretty fast. It can be less because of pipelining. If it's six or more, which is my rule, this is not, not hard and fast. If it's six or more, your CPI is six or more, that's when you're starting to significantly wait on memory. Uh, when I first looked at this on the, uh, our Sun storage systems, our CPI was over 10. So if we were to go and buy faster CPUs, it really wouldn't have helped. In fact, I tested it with faster CPUs and it didn't help. Uh, it's an experiment I actually had done. So a CPI of 10. On average, every instruction, we have 10 cycles. Most of them are just waiting for memory I.O. Um, how do you measure CPI? I think I've got Solaris running, so uh, I can switch to it. You can use CPU stat for it. Um, if you haven't used CPU stat much, you run CPU stat minus H, and you then go and read the book it tells you to read, and by the time you get to the end of it, you know how, what these things mean. Uh, it's not the most user-friendly tool in the world, but uh, you can eventually figure that stuff out. Intel AMD? Uh, everything. So CPU stat should work on everything. Spark, Intel, AMD. And, and you're looking in here for uh, how to pull out how to pull out the memory, uh, the cycle count and the instruction count and do a simple division. In fact, I give you a demonstration of it in uh, Solaris Performance and Tools because it's a very important value to pluck out. And also, there's a demonstration of doing this on my blog as well. And I give you a script to do it. Is that true for all I.O. and not just memory? It, de- it depends how it's uh, accessing the uh, device. For, for, I mean, for network and disk I.O., um, often it will be sending it down to the I.O. controller. 
And then the CPU is not going to stall whilst that disk spindle spins. It just sends that buffer down. But it's a good thing to think about, right? This is not, this is not entirely uh, the memory stall cycles. Because if you're just doing cycles per instruction, it's other stuff. So you might want to... CPI can give you a... Uh, CPI is the most basic thing you can check. So it will, it will give you a hint that something's wrong. But yes, yeah, spend more time. Actually pull out the memory stall cycles, pull out the I.O. controller, uh, the time spent talking to the I.O. controllers to really break it down to what it should be. So, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, CPI is just step... It's like looking at uh, load average to know that you've got busy CPUs. So looking at CPI is like, okay, I think I've got some sort of a bus problem. And then try and figure out which bus it is. Um, so on my blog, I just wanted to mention it. It's a... Uh, Um, it's a bit small on the screen, but AMD 64 CPI dash kernel cycles instructions CPI is 11. My percent CPU is 95% because I'm spending so much time waiting for memory I/O. In fact, to finish that example off. Um, it wasn't the memory buses themselves that were the problem there. And I explained it on that blog entry. It was actually the hypertransport that connected the CPUs together. That had become congested. And if CPU socket zero needed to talk to a, a remote DRAM bank, it has to hop over these hypertransports, those dark black links. They were congested. So you, you're actually doing a memory load or store to a remote DRAM bank, but it's the uh, CPU interconnect that's throttling you down. That exhibited itself as not just high percent CPU, but a, a high CPI. And when we finally, which we did very recently, upgraded to a newer hypertransport, went from hypertransport 1 to hypertransport 3, uh, the difference that made is, is phenomenal. 1.9 gigabytes a second to 3.06 gigabytes a second NFS traffic. Yeah, I need to stop this. I said this presentation was not going to be about awesome performance numbers. It was going to be about bad things. That's good things. Back to bad things. All right. So faster CPUs equals more performance. Um, maybe not. More IOPS capability equals more performance. Another poor assumption. So if I have a product that can do, product A can do more IOPS than product B, it's not as simple as that. That would be nice. Um, I could design a server that could do a million IOPS that you wouldn't want me to give to you for free. Uh, I could do it by buying the slowest, slowest possible disks and buying thousands of them. And so, yeah, the thing can do a million IOPS because it can do them concurrently, and each IOP takes maybe 100 milliseconds. So it would actually be unusable in production. Uh, some vendors do something quite similar when, they, when, they're, doing, when they're trying to uh, uh, do benchmarks that sound impressive. So that's why I wanted to mention it. Don't get wooed by huge IOP, IOPS numbers. Think about the latency involved as well. Network throughput. An IOPS measured on the client reflects that of the server. This assumption, uh, we often talk about this as the number one assumption that people get wrong. Is they, and I understand how it comes about. You download some tool from, from the internet, maybe it's IOZone or, or Bonnie, and you're going to do your own performance test. Uh, maybe you're doing it locally. Uh, maybe, well, actually, in, in this case, maybe you're doing it uh, over NFS because I'm talking about client caching, not local caching. You're doing it over NFS or, or, or SIFS, and you run your benchmark tool. And it says, this is the throughput and IOPS I measured. Usually, NFS client implementations will perform client caching. So if you're... And, and also, another problem is some of these tools, they pick a very small working set size by default. Maybe it's only 100 megabytes. And your client has a gigabyte of DRAM. So it might perform this benchmark test, create a file, read from it, and tell you that the performance is fantastic, but very little has actually gone over the wire to the target server. 
So you're trying to measure the performance of a target without actually exercising the target. You're actually measuring client performance. The very, very common problem, client caching. Um, we try and avoid it by, if, if, say, it's an NFS test, have a look at the mount options in NFS and see if you can switch off the client cache. Uh, they'll guarantee that you're not client cache bound. Uh, or deliberately create a working set size that's much, much, much bigger than the client can possibly cache. Again, so that you can eliminate the effect of the client cache. System buses are fast. I guess I've already mentioned that. System buses can be the bottleneck. Um, we definitely had that ourselves. 10 gigabit Ethernet can be driven by one client. Uh, another one that we get a lot. That may be true in the future, but uh, I, I, it's not true now. I've seen close to saturating a 10 gigabit connection from one client, doing an actual workload such as NFS, uh, but I've, I've never seen it done easily. And that's after many hours of custom tuning. 10 gigabits a second is a lot of traffic. That's, that's 1.16 gigabytes a second. So you can't just plug in any client and expect it to drive that. If I'm doing 10 gigabit connect, uh, testing, I use at least 10 clients, uh, often 20. Uh, here in Colorado, we've got a client rig of 41 clients to test 10 gigabit networks. So uh, as the clients get faster and faster, we'll need fewer and fewer of them because they have more grunt. A another point to make about this, let's say you're doing an NFS test. The target server can respond entirely out of the kernel. A request comes in, it's cached, here's your reply. A request comes in, it's off disk, schedule that through ZFS, here's your reply. However, the client for it to generate that workload is often running a user land application. That's actually more difficult because it has to context switch from user land to the kernel, to copy ins and copy outs. So the rule is it's more difficult for a client to drive a workload than for a server to accept it. Um, you know, so long as the client is doing it from user land, the, kernel, the server's doing it from kernel. So that's one of the reasons why it's, you need a lot of clients. Performance observability tools are designed to be the best possible. This does trick a lot of people. Uh, as a customer, you're learning performance through tools like VMstat and MPstat. Uh, and the assumption is, well, and, and especially uh, NetStat and SAR. Anyone use SAR, System Activity Reporter? Okay, a few people. <laughs> a few, few people don't want to confess to it. Um, uh, if you've got customers on Linux, it's the only option. Well, it's better than nothing. Um, there is an assumption that I've run into a lot that these tools have to be fine because the vendors have been shipping them for years. Uh, no, that's, that's called status quo. Uh, and also, as, uh, many performance observability tools I've seen are designed by kernel engineers who, or, or engineers who may not be customer-facing. They may not really understand the sort of issues customers have, the sort of requirements they have. So don't assume that any performance tool out there is going to be extremely well designed, it's going to be accurate, it's going to fulfill the need. A lot of people get, I, I think it actually makes performance analysis more of a black art than it really needs to be. The fact that um, some of these tools are so prolific and so ancient and may not be the best ways to get your head around performance, um, such as VMstat and SAR. 